was given very bad news. I actually was told they only had six weeks to live. And of course, obviously, he was not expecting that downer kind of a diagnosis and was very upset about it. And the doctor looked at him he, he, and asked him, was there anything I could do? He said, well, the only thing I can think of is there's a new spa that's opened up down just a couple of blocks down the street and they specialize in mud baths. You might want to try that. And he said, oh, that saved me? He said, no, but it'll get you used to the dirt. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I thought, well, I'm glad I don't go to that doctor. <laughs> it's not very difficult for me to get that kind of potato. <laughs> I thought today I was speaking to it. an audience in this country. You know, we have different concepts of God. And we always want God to do something to help us. And another friend of mine was as in, out in California. You know, Larry just came back through there, so he can tell you about it. They hear a different beat of the drum out there. And this old boy was praying very sincerely because he was expressing his last wishes to God. And he said, God, just, can you just please grant me one wish? Just one wish. And, Things became very quiet and he hears this great deep voice and God said yes because of your kindness in your life I'll grant you one wish what is it now this you have to be in Southern California to appreciate this man's wish he said God he said all my life all my life I've wanted to go to Hawaii but I don't like to fly and I get seasick on a boat can you build for me a four-lane highway from Los Angeles to Honolulu you know, God was very quiet. And finally he said, my son, I'm so disappointed in you. <clears throat> You've built a good life. And here you think of the most materialistic kind of a wish. It would take thousands of hours, millions and billions of dollars in effort to build that road. Can't you think of a more spiritual kind of a wish? The man thought a while. He said, oh God. Can you tell me how to understand a woman because she cries and I don't understand it? She gets quiet and I don't understand what made her quiet. She's harsh with me sometimes and I don't understand. Can you help me understand a woman? And God was very quiet and finally God said, how many lanes did you <laughs> Yes, you know, we don't appreciate that. It's, uh, you know, women are different than men. You, you will understand that. And some women are very set in their ways and their understandings. And I had a friend, I was living I lived up in the northern part of Texas. And <laughs> the park near the Trinity River had flooded and was just coming up near her lawn. And, Finally, they got up in her yard and she heard this noise and there was a small little boat there, a couple of policemen and said, ma'am, you're going to have to leave or you, 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 can, you can drown it. She said, I'm not leaving. This is my home. I've been here for 50 years. I'm not leaving. They, and they had other things to do. They couldn't sit there and argue, so they left. And the water continued to rise. And the water got waist deep. And another boat came by and close friends of hers and he said Mabel you've got to get out of there you're going to drown you've got to leave I'm not leaving here I've been here 50 years this is my home I inherited it from my parents they were here for 50 years before me I'm not leaving they couldn't know anything about it they left and the water kept rising and got up this hair on the poor woman and she was looking around and she heard <laughs> helicopter up there and the man hollered down and says, Ma'am, you've got to, we'll lower a rope, we'll take you away, you have to leave, you'll drown. I am not leaving, I have faith. I'll stay here, this is my home. Went away. After a while, the water continued to rise, and the poor woman drowned. And she's confronted by God in the next world, and God said, he shook his head. She said, I believed in you all my life. Why didn't you save me? He said, ma'am, 
I sent you two boats and a helicopter. You know? <laughs> Now, friend, that's a joke point, but a lot of times that's the way we pray in our understanding of God. We're sincere. But a lot of times people's concept of God is not based on reality. I wanted to talk briefly this morning about the condition of our country. And many of you came here from other countries, some of you born and raised here. But our country is in a worse mess now than it's ever been in the history of its existence. We're the most materialistic country that ever existed on the planet Earth, according to Shoghi Effendi Rabbani, the guardian of high faith. And we are. I'd like to read you what I read. I had, before I came here, I put together some, some thoughts I had picked up from some of the reading I've been picking up on. on and this was posted on my computer here two weeks ago. In the United States today, we spend more on restaurant food than on grocery food. When I was a kid growing up here, you didn't see everybody going to a restaurant every day of the week. You do now. And they take their children. Nobody took children to a restaurant when I was a kid growing up. Now every restaurant's filled every day. The size of American families continues to shrink, the size of them, but the square footage of our houses continue to expand. I live in an area where they tear down good housing, build bigger housing, and two or three people in. That is the United States today. The number of self-storage units has grown tenfold since the 1960s. Not because people are moving, they're putting stored stuff in there they want to keep. There's no room for it in the big houses. Children spend six hours a day on an average in front of the television and computers, these little computer games. And they spend 12 minutes a day on average in intimate conversation with their parents. Each hour of television exposes them to 30 commercials. The average American household carries $15,270 in credit and debts. That's average in the country today. I'm telling you, that's serious business. Now I would like to help if my friend Arthur can get someone to help me to pass out. These, this statement by Shoghi Fendi, the only reason I'm passing out is most of you have never read it. So I wouldn't take up your time with it otherwise. And this is, and I want the leftover back, okay. This is written in, Nova, in, in, in September before the Guardian died in 1957, just three months before he died. This is last word, our NSA. And you can take it or leave it, but that's the condition you're in and I'm in right here in this letter. And it's scary. I wouldn't take your time reading it. That's his view of it. And uh, I want to talk, if I can, briefly about it, because I don't, I honestly don't believe most of us are aware of it. We rock along and lost in our own little struggles in life and trying to get along. And if you'll read that closely, maybe we can. Talk a little about it in the context of what my talk's about, being born again. So I'll read this with you as we start out. And this is what Shoghi Effendi wrote to our National Assembly. It was the last letter, as far as I know, our NSA ever got from Shoghi Effendi before he died. And these are his words, they're not mine. And if you're a Baha'i, then you know the importance of them because this was his understanding of the condition of this nation over 50 years ago. The Baha'is, speaking from a Baha'i viewpoint, are the leaven of God, which must leaven the lump of their nation. In direct ratio, in direct ratio to their success will be the protection vouchsafed not only to them but to their country. These are the immutable laws of God from which there is no escape. For unto whomsoever much is given of him shall much be required. And then he says this. They cannot be the chosen of God, the ones who have received the bounty of accepting him in his day. The recipients of the master's divine plan and do nothing about it. Now, friends, if you're here from some other country, you need to realize nobody ever gave your other country the path of the divine plan. The guardian, 
was talking about a plan given to us by Abu Baha. He gave it to us in Canada and nobody else. And that's what he's talking about, and you're in that country. The obligation to teach is the obligation of every Baha'i, and particularly the obligation of the American Baha'is towards humanity are great and inescapable. And then he says this, to the degree to which they discharge them, will they be blessed and protected, happy and satisfied. There are no more active Baha'i in this country now than they were in 1958. So if you think we're doing a good job, you're just, uh, you're out in left field, friend. The question I'll put it straight to you, how many Baha'is did you teach the faith to this year? I'm not talking about going to a deepening class. Abu Baha said all of us, all of us, can at least share this faith and attract at least one person a year into the faith. And that's the words of Abu Baha, it's not the words of me or anybody else. And I want to be blunt and it may really offend somebody. I don't care what you think or I think about it. I don't know. And I don't pretend to know, but I do know that Abu Baha did know. I've been a Baha'i nearly 54 years. I went through a very fine university. And I went through one of the best theology schools in this country, and I was an active minister almost seven years, and I saw the hopelessness of it. I was in Korea, I saw people being killed. And I came back looking for something to establish peace. And if you think politicians are going to establish peace, you're crazy as hell. They never have, they never will, and we've had over 5,000 years of human history. They're not going to establish it. And they may be doing it the best they can and be just as sincere as you and I will ever be, but they don't have the means to do it. You can't do it. And you can't do it in the country you came from if you're from some other country, and you can't do it here. It doesn't change your human heart. And you can't change your own heart either. I ran mental health centers for 14 years. I had 14 psychiatrists working under me when I retired. They can't change your heart. They can help you understand maybe why you're miserable, or why you're hurt, or why you're in depression, but they can't change your heart. They can't make you love God, and they can't make you love anybody else. They can help you understand it, but that's it. Now I ask you, There's not a person in this room that's not carrying some cross, as the Christians say today. And Abu Baha said, why? Because he said, look at the, look at the fabric of your hand. Abu Baha said, look at it. It's made of crosses. God put the cross into the fabric of every bit of human flesh because it's a symbol of the suffering of humanity. We all carry crosses, and you'll carry them to your last breath. You want to carry them alone? No. And so we all drift to struggling with it one way or other as we get older. And I think most people are sincere about it. They get very discouraged because what they work at works partially but not completely, it just doesn't do the job. All right, so that's where we're in today. You and I live in a dangerous little world. When I was a kid growing up, it took huge armies. I remember the day the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor as clear as as I remember getting up this morning. My whole world changed in one day. Within a year, on the street I lived on, you had several stars in the windows of the mothers who lost their kids in the war. Changed the whole world from then on. And now it doesn't take an army to do it. Six or seven people can blow this city of Houston off the map with nuclear, biological, or chemical weapons. That's the world you live in. And to say that you think some people don't live who think they're helping the world by blowing it up, you're crazy. They do, and we can prove it. I didn't used to believe it, but it's fact of life. There are people who really think they can blow us all sitting up here today, everybody in this city, and they think they're going to paradise, and God bless them for doing it. And there are people like that, and it doesn't take many of them to blow you off the map. Now, don't fake it, man. That's where it is. I have a very close friend, a very close friend, my wife. He was head of the Port of Houston for 30 full long years. And he said, you know, if they get the right container down here to, with the right stuff in, they could blow up a third of Houston in one blast. That's the world you live in, in one afternoon. 
Some, in, in our writings it says this, the high writings in one place it says, of a sudden there shall that appear which shall cause the limbs of mankind to quake, quote and unquote. Now I don't know what that means. I'm not pretending that I do, but I know I give them a lot of thought to it. And it's the world I live in. I don't have to be a, a rocket scientist to know the world I can, I'm living in can change instantly if the wrong, wrong people get in charge of stuff. And I know many sincere people who are working hard as they can to establish peace and do good things. I was listening to this video that's playing here. That I, my heart goes out to one worrying about, you know, the pollution in the world, but she, did, she didn't mention God Almighty and she's not going to change it because, because she's interested in it. There are people just as sincere, interested in making a living, want to saw down the trees and do whatever. It takes more than that to, ch to change the human heart, friends. You've got to have something to come to contact with. If, if your concept of reality is you just live and make money and die, then God help you for having ever been born. This life has no meaning if that's it. And Abu Baha said, if all there is to life is this, it's not, no meaning to it. He said it in four or five places. I could read you a statement from the Baha'i writing. This is straight out of our, our, our book. Rest assured that the breathings of the Holy Spirit will loosen thy tongue. You think, well, you're not trained to teach. This is what our writings say. Speak, therefore, speak out with great courage at every meeting. When thou art about to begin thine address, turn first to Baha'u'llah and ask for the confirmation of the Holy Spirit. Then open thy lips and say whatever is suggested to thy heart. This, however, with the utmost courage, dignity, and conviction. It is my hope that from day to day your gathering will grow and flourish, and those who are seeking after truth will hearken therein to reasoned arguments and conclusive proofs. I am with you, heart and soul, at every meeting. Be sure of this. Now, friends, Abba Baha gave to this nation. And we got the thing, I think, in 1917. The tablets of the divine plan. And he divided this country into four areas and gave a prayer for each area. And we have a prayer for this area. And if you don't know it, God help you. That's all I can tell you. Oh God, oh God, behold me. Notwithstanding my lowliness and my lack of capacity and ability, I am bent upon the accomplishment of the greatest work aiming to promote thy word amongst the republics and resolve to spread thy teaching amongst all mankind. Far be it from me to become confirmed in this work. Say thou must assist me with the breath of the Holy Spirit. Make me victorious through the armies of thy supreme kingdom and encircle me with thy confirmation which shall make the moth the eagle the drop the rivers and the seas and the scintillas, the suns and the moons. O oh Lord, confirm me with thine insuperable power and thy penetrating potency so that my tongue may speak out thy praises and glorification amongst thy creatures. My heart become overflowed with thy wine and knowledge. Now friends, if you don't know how that prayer, God help you. You're not going to do it by yourself without the confirmation of the Holy Spirit of God. You can't do it. And I can't do it. You don't know what this lady needs to hear. I don't know. God can prompt through his own spirit into your heart if you turn your heart to him to focus and say something to attract them to the faith. Without attraction, no one's going to look. No one gives a hoot. Nobody really cares about your intellectual concept or some theological concept behind it. Please, on the back of a dog. People are concerned about their world today. And without knowledge of this faith, they're not going to find an answer to it. I'm not saying they don't. A lot of wonderful people know God. A man can pray to God Almighty direct whether he knows anything about religion or not. I was in foxholes and I know what it's like. And when you're laying there being shot at and your buddy's been blown all to hell, you sure are praying to God Almighty. And I'm sure he hears your prayer, but it doesn't bring peace to this planet. Now, Jesus Christ, when he walked this planet, 
desired strongly to teach this message. And our faith said he brought the oneness of mankind, that message to the world. Our faith says that. But he says this, I have many more things to send to you, but you cannot bear it. How be it when he who is the spirit of truth shall come, he shall teach you all things. And we, Baha'i, say the spirit of truth has come in Baha'u'llah to teach you all things, to bring peace on this planet. That's our purpose. That's our life. That's everything we do is focused on that. We believe a very simple teaching is basic to life, the oneness of humankind. God, God Almighty doesn't give a hoot about your skin color. He doesn't care whether you speak Swahili, Japanese, or Hoodoo. Who gives a hoot? He's concerned in your heart what kind of a character you have, whether you love everybody, whether you can give your life to serve humanity, or whether you just want to live and live out your time and die and rot and go in a hole in the ground. And that's where it is. We can say nice things and joke and laugh all we want to, but our life is playing out. I'm 84 years old. I sure can't be alive very much longer. And I don't want to sit and have to face my God saying I didn't say it, that I tried to raise the banner. If anyone put something on my headstone, I just wish they'd put two words. I tried. Now this country has been given by Abu Baha a plan to help all humanity to establish peace on this planet. I've known many Baha'is. I've traveled in every state in this country but two. I never got into South Dakota. I never got into Alaska. I got into all the rest of it. They're good Baha'is in every one of them. But friends, I think we get hurt. We get knocked down. We get life knocked out of us. And we need to be together as one. And we need to listen to the guidance we're being given from the high and Ifa. And a lot of times you can listen, but you just have lost the energy to do anything about it. My friend Larry here is a very intelligent man, and he is deeply knowledgeable. He recently went to the Far East, and he came back and talked, 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 because he was so surprised about what he found there. It wasn't what he thought he would find. My friend Mehran back there does two things. He, he sits around, you know, these restaurants a couple of nights a week and trying to get people to come together. And he does, he's a good cook, you know, that you've been to his house. He attracts people to go over there and tries and share the faith. And I admire people like that. Otto back there, every time I come into this old center down here, he's always grinning and sharing and welcoming me here. Makes you feel good to have to see his smiling face. You ought to have a special reward in the next world because a lot of people, not, you know, they don't look like smiley people, you know. <laughs> he makes you feel good. Who wants to be around a long-faced, miserable Baha'i? I don't. Good Lord, protect me from miserable Baha'is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you want to be around somebody who has the experience of being in touch with the God that made them, and that's being born again. Now let me, if I can, it's, it's right along my wife. Says, Nobody wants you to read that long a thing. Well, it's too bad she didn't come with me. I'm going to read it. <laughs> <laughs> you see, it just wisdom to these things. So you understand? Baha'u'llah teaches that the world of humanity is in need of the breath of the Holy Spirit. For in spiritual quickening and enlightenment, true oneness is attained with God and man. Now listen to this, friends. Please, please listen to this. Universal peace is an impossibility through human and material agencies. It must be through spiritual power. That's either true or it's a lie. In my experience in life, it's true. I've worked in government in 34 different countries. <laughs> That's the truest statement I ever read in my life. You're only going to get peace through spiritual power. There is need of, universal, of a universal impelling force which will establish the oneness of humanity and destroy the foundations of war and strife. None other than the divine power can do this. Therefore, it will be accomplished with the breath of the Holy Spirit. 
no matter how far the material world advances, it cannot establish the happiness of mankind. Only when material and spiritual civilizations are linked and coordinated will happiness be assured. Now we have in this room, over here, Harmos Bastami. He will never even grunt, smile, or say a word to you because he doesn't think people are interested. He's taught the faith in more countries than anyone who ever lived on this planet except for Hikarnum and Dr. Mahajir. And I'll guarantee you he will bear witness to the truth that I just said. You're not going to have any spiritual peace in this world without the recognition of Baha'u'llah ultimately. Because religions get into arguments. They fuss over a little too bit theological issues. They have clashes. Now and then you find a minister, a priest, or a rabbi trying to overcome that and they can't do it. Because they have not gotten in touch with the one who brought the message to do it. And you can't make it up. You can find pieces of it. I worked with two young men when I was young. I helped establish a big government program in this country called Job Corps. I worked with two men, wonderful men. They were members of a universalist church, I think it's, that, that was their church, they were, but they were atheists, you know, you can belong to that church and not believe in God. But they were good people, <clears throat> but it's not enough. It's just not enough. God made you to know him and to worship him, that's what our little prayer says every day at now. And to know God, you have to come in touch with the reality of that spirit. The divine civilization is good because it civilizes and brings about morals. Consider what the prophets of God have been contributed to human morality. Jesus Christ summoned all to the most great peace through the acquisition of pure morals. If the moral precepts and foundation of design, divine civilization become united, with the material advancement of men, there is no doubt that the happiness of the human world will be attained. Well, that's where it comes down to. So now, I'd like to read you what I came here to talk about. And I'm not just saying that this is serious business with me. I became interested in trying to find answers to this problem when I was 13 years old as a kid. And I'll guarantee you, had I not had my experiences as a Baha'i, I wouldn't be here today, friend. If I had not come in touch with the reality of Baha'u'llah, I would never have gone and done what I try to do with my life. If you don't come in touch with it, there's no one way to do it. Nobody's got a cookbook on how you need to do it. But you need to pray sincerely to get in touch with your Lord and Savior. Now here's what the master says. And I, I am speaking to you from my background. You'll have to forgive me because many of you were raised in the country with a background with the Quran. I don't know anything about the Quran. I have an elder son who knows he's an authority on it. speaks both Arabic and Persian and several, you know, the different dialogues of those languages. But I don't. But I do know something about the Bible. And I know what Christianity teaches. And that's where I'm coming from. And the only reason I'm reading you these talks is Abel Baha came to this country in 1912 and he spoke to the American people. Every talk, I will read some of the excerpts to you today, come from what Abel Baha said in the United States of America. It's not the same thing he said in London or in Paris because he's talking to Americans from their background and that's where you are today and this is our background and he's speaking straight to you. So if you will be humble enough. And if God will help me, I'd like to read you what he says on this subject, because it's the only place in the world that I've ever read where anybody laid out what it means to be born again. And I spent years of my time and my money and my effort trying to understand it as a Christian. And every church I got in, there was arguments about what was the meaning of it. Now, if you want to know what it means, I'm going to read you several of his paragraphs. It takes a little time. I hope you'll be patient with me. But if you have an interest and want to know what it means to be born again, I'm going to read you what it means. And then if you have a question or two, maybe we can deal with it. But I want to read you what we believe about it. And what I believe about it in my whole soul. This is Abba Baha. 
I shall conclude with the words of Jesus Christ. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit and is acceptable in the kingdom of God. This means, this is what he says, this means, that's what Christ has said, this is what it says it means. This means that just as in the first birth, the fetus comes forth from the matrix of the mother into the conditions of the human kingdom, even so the spirit of man must be born out of the matrix of naturalism, out of the baser nature, in order that he may comprehend the great things of the kingdom of God. He must be born out of Mother Earth to find the everlasting life. And this collective reality or spirit of man being born out of the world of nature possessing the attributes of God will continue to live forever in the eternal realm. Now as a Christian I was taught when I was a little child before I could read or write, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now if I die and I cannot function spiritually, where in the world do you think I will be in, in the realm of reality? I can't function. I have a, no spirit development in me. And that's what I was talking about. Because the world after this is a spiritual world. And there is a world after this. We have many arguments proving it. Person in that wants to study that. And Mehran, wake up. I know Mehran is sick. Let's, let's say a prayer for Mehran right now. Thy name is my healing, O oh my God. The remembrance of thee is my remedy. <coughs> Nearness to thee is my hope, and love for thee is my companion. Thy mercy to me is my healing and my succor in both this world and the world to come. Thou verily the all bountiful, the all knowing, the all wise. You know, forgive me, but I just had to say that prayer. I love Mehran. And he has served the faith so great. And he's got cancer now. He needs your prayers. The station of man is great, very great. God has created man after his own image and likeness. He has endowed him with a mighty power which is capable of discovering the mysteries of phenomena. Through its use, man is able to arrive at ideal conclusions instead of being restricted to the mere plane of sense impression. As he possesses sense and diamond in common with the animals, it is evident that he is distinguished above them by his conscious power of penetrating abstract realities. He acquires divine wisdom. He searches out the mysteries of creation. This is the foundation of the world of humanity. This is the image and likeness of God. This is the reality of man. Otherwise, he is an animal. Verily, God has created the animal in the image and likeness of man. For through man, and though man is outwardly human, yet in nature he possesses animal tendencies. You know people like that, and so do I. And we have animal tendencies. We have a lower nature and a higher nature. Everybody does. But suppose your higher nature is not quickened. Suppose it's not brought to life. Suppose it doesn't develop. You've only got one nature growing and you're not going to fake it and I'm not going to fake it and we're going to take the final exam and nobody's going to cheat on it. I don't care what school you went to or didn't go to. What culture you come from, what language you speak, how much money you've got or how you, no money you've got. You, nobody's going to fake it when you die. We were put on this earth to know one thing, to know and to worship God Almighty. And if you don't discover that, you're in trouble, friend. Now, I can say that in nice ways and cultural ways, but I spent my life doing that. And this country's in a mess. People have to be waked up. And sometimes the waking up process is disturbing. <laughs> It is clearly evident that man possesses powers in common with the animal. He is distinguished from the animal by intellectual attainment, spiritual perception, the acquisition of virtues, capacity to receive the bestowals of divinity, largely bound in emanations of heavenly mercy. This is the adornment of man, his honor and sublimity. Now, he gets down to even more detail here. Here's Abba-Baha's prayer. I pray that the confirmation of God may descend upon you. 
May you all be born again from this mortal world into the realm of the kingdom. May you clearly witness the signs of God, sense the virtues of the divine, attain the eternal bounties, and perceive the reality of everlasting life. The prophets come into this world to guide and educate humanity so that the animal nature of man may disappear and the divinity of his power become awakened. The divine aspect of spiritual nature consists of the breath of the Holy Spirit. The second birth of what Jesus has spoken refers to the appearance of this heavenly nature in man. It is expressed in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and he who is baptized by the Holy Spirit is a veritable manifestation of divine mercy to mankind. Now the tab, he says, there is however another spirit which may be termed the divine to which Jesus Christ refers when he declares that man must be born of his quickening and baptized with his living fire. So deprived of that spirit are accounted as dead though they are possessed of the human spirit. Jesus Christ has pronounced them dead inasmuch as they have no portion of the divine spirit. This is Abu Baha speaking. He says, let the dead bury their dead. In another instance, he declares that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. By this he means that soul, though alive in the human king, kingdom, are nevertheless dead if devoid of this particular spirit of divine quickening. They have not partaken of the divine life of the higher kingdom, for the soul which partakes of the power of the divine spirit is verily living. Well, I could go on and read. I have many quotes on that subject, but I, I'm concerned that if you ever ask yourself, are you born again? Do you know Baha'u'llah? There's a story we have, you're familiar with us in the Baha'i prayer, where we have a prayer that can be said at his shrine, but it's also a private prayer, where he says, if you pray that prayer in the right spirit, it's the same thing as seeing Abba Baha face to face. That's either a lie or it's the truth. There's another statement of Baha'u'llah, where he says, where Abba Baha is talking about Baha'u'llah, and he said to this man, you saw him once in Haifa, you saw him in, in his physical being, but you didn't recognize him. He said, however, to see him was spiritual because, from a Baha'i viewpoint, hell rank higher than that. So I'm not talking about John Doe. They're not just people appointed to do something. There were 50 hands of the cause of God appointed in the Baha'i faith. Baha'u'llah himself appointed for, his son Abu Baha appointed for, and the guardian appointed for him too. And of that, many of them were appointed after their passing. Several of them, I can, if you're interested in that type of information, I have their name to those who were appointed posthumously because they're very famous people in the Baha'i faith. And Esselmont, who wrote this little book, you're familiar with. Haji Amin, he was a great collector of the Baha'i funds in, in uh, Iran. Keith Ransom Kaler, which was the most remarkable writer of all the hands in my mind. I don't know if you, many of you not read anything she ever wrote. She's a tremendously brilliant woman. Martha Root, who was the most outstanding of all the hands of the cause, was a woman, not a man. Traveled all over the world and has a good book you could read about her life. John Henry Hyde Dunn was appointed. He and his wife, Mother Dunn, were both hands of the cause, but he was appointed after he died. His wife appointed, she's still alive. They did all their fine work in Australia, but they left this country to do it. Uh, Syed Mustafa, Abu Jalil Bey, Muhammad, I can't pronounce it, Taki. 
It's fine. He, Roy Wilhelm, who the Guardian wrote when he died, was a saint in this country. He was a wonderful human being. And Louis Gregory, who was the most outstanding African American guy in this country. So those are the ones the Guardian appointed after their death. The rest of them were alive when he appointed them, and I can only talk meaningfully about those I knew. I knew 17 of them. I worked with 17 of them at different times. And I can only share, you know, a few stories, because I could talk all day and all night about it. <coughs> to be quite candid with you, I would not be here if it were not hand to the cops. That's simple. I don't make any bones about it. You know, I was behind when there was no integration. We got shot at, cars bombed, house next to mine blown all to hell in Florida. There was no fun in the early days when I was a Baha'i. In 1959, I became a Baha'i. And I was appointed almost immediately by Bill Sears and Mr. Codem to be an auxiliary board member. And I had 12 states from Texas through Florida and the Carolinas. Curtis Kelsey came down a little later, and he was a board member. He had worked with Abel Baha'i and had installed the lights that you have now still in Haifa and the Shrine of Bob and Baha'u'llah and in Baji. So we worked together, and Bill Tucker from North Carolina was appointed. But that was it for the whole South. I knew every living Baha'i from Texas to the bottom of Florida up to North Carolina, every one of them. I visited them. And I had a job that enabled me to do it. And were not for the prayers, I wouldn't have made it. I don't play any games about it, friends. It was tough, so it was not easy. But if you went to a Baha'i fireside in these little places, you find them through the southern states. There was so much spirit and so much love in them, you wouldn't leave for one or two in the morning. Nobody did. It wasn't because we knew so much. It was because of the love between the Baha'is was that strong. And it was not fake, friend. Your life depended on each other. I traveled through the, all the southern states, Mississippi, Louisiana, all these places with us. African-American guy, Wilbert Solomon, he must have weighed 255 pounds, played tackle at Morehouse College in Atlanta. And a white man traveling with a black man was a dangerous proposition. First thing we did, we went in a motel just to open up the telephone to see if somebody was tapping the phone or something, or poke up the stuff, the room, see if they're tapping. It was dangerous. And I'm gonna set the stage for that because that's what the hands had to deal with in this part of the world. As far as I know personally, first hand to ever set foot in this state was Martha Root. I met a lady, the first Baha'i in Austin, who met her in Austin. Leroy Ivis later, who was the secretary of the Guardian, when the Guardian passed away, was secretary. Been on RNSA many years before that. He came to this state. Mr. Kadim came to this state. Mr. Sears came to this state. If there are others I was not aware of, those I knew about. And so that's for the Texas end of it. But I, did, I felt like maybe the easiest thing I could do to make it meaningful to you, just tell you a few stories about what it was like to be with these men and women. And I want to say this in a way that I hope is not, put, it doesn't put you off. They're not, they weren't people like you and me, friend. Don't you ever believe a word of that? They were so much more spiritual than you and me, we're not involved in it. Every one of them. And they were nothing alike as individuals. At all. So I will read you the names of the ones that I knew well. And you can ask me whatever you want to know about any one of them. Some of them interest you at all. Many of you knew some of them. Many of you didn't know all of them and so forth. I knew Mr. Fortan very well. I knew Dr. Jerry Carey. I, I served with Dr. Jerry Carey this year in Robarts and Codem. Leroy Iwas, I knew well. Mr. Simondari, I, I would like to share an experience I had with him because he was one of the most remarkable human beings I ever met in my entire life. And many of you may have known him. Mr. Alai, Shulai Alai, he's buried out in Arizona, and then up right near Phoenix. Musa Banani, I was in his home in Africa, and he was alive. Mr. Kadem, Rahia Kadem, of course, many of you met or saw her. Paul Haney, 
Mr. Varga than Dr. Varga in the hand of the cause. He was very different than most persons. I'll tell you why. And please don't get hurt if I say something to offend you, okay? Do me that favor. I'm a Texan and I'm direct. Most of you Persians like butterflies. You flip, 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 flip around. I'm a bumblebee. <laughs> That's a very different proposition. Well, Varga was a bumblebee. Any most unusual person I ever saw, like you asked a straight question, he gave you a straight answer. Kind and loving as, as a human could be, but he gave you a straight answer. No, 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 no. He didn't, he was no bumblebee. I mean, no, no butterfly talker. So Agnes Alexander, she was one of one, two women mentioned the whole tablets of the divine plan. She was part of the root. I knew Agnes. Mr. Faisy, many of you knew, one of the kindest humans God Almighty ever created anywhere at any time in history. That man is so kind is unbelievable. And I know if it were not for him and Bill Sears, I wouldn't be sitting here. No way in hell or heaven. And I don't play any games with that. Because they held my hand in some very difficult times in my life. And it wasn't easy serving on your National Assembly in the 60s, and I did. And it was no easy proposition. And those men were angels, angels, angels. Dr. Mahajri, the most unusual human being I ever met in my life. Nobody like him. If you ever want to see the living, walking image of action, that was Mahajri. He had no more time to sit around and you're deep in classes than nothing. He wanted you out moving and teaching. And he, he went with you if necessary. He was a mover and a shaker if God ever created one. And died as a very young man. He wasn't old when he died. He was only 56 years old when he died. Enoch Olinga, he was only 53 when he died. The only African appointed a hand of the cause. And I have an interesting story about him. I, I want to tell you if I forget it to remind me. Mr. Robarts, Canadian, and of course Bill Sears. But I'd like to open with telling a story about a man that you all know or know of or maybe have seen. Mr. Samandri in the hand of the cops. And uh, you know, he he was a little guy. I went to the London Congress, World Congress, first one we ever had in 63 in London. And he was speaking down front, Marzi Gill was his translator. He had a voice like a lion, this little bitty guy, you know. And I didn't walk up to shake my, his hand or meet him or anything. All these people were crowded around, you know. And later, I was back in this country in the 60s, I was a member of your National Assembly. And, uh, we had word he was coming with his son, maybe from, he had been up in Canada. And we had a little, we had rented a little African-American AME church camp down in Georgia, near Fort Valley, Georgia, Camp Hope. And we were having a meeting there, and he was going to visit there. And everybody was excited. I lived in Atlanta at that time. And he was already old, he was over 90 when he was making that trip. And so, the house notified me <coughs> this way, in particular, and they say, don't let the Baha'is crowd around him and push him and, you know, make it difficult for him because his health was just so fragile. And so I was trying my best to be as obedient as I could be to it. And I was not able to get out to the little camp early on the month of the day he was arriving. So I left a little late because it had to work. And I, it, you take, you're not interested in this kind of detail, but I have to tell the story the way that I remember. Now, the U.S. Highway 75 interstate, Eisenhower had just opened his interstate system and got out of a little place called Perry, Georgia. And the camp was about 11 miles inland from there, and I was hungry, and I knew I was too late to eat breakfast at the camp. So I drove out to, uh, saw a Holiday Inn on the side of the road, and went in there to pull off, because it had a little restaurant attached to it, and walked in there, and there was the man. Obviously, I recognized him. I'd seen him in high school with his son. Now, I was doing my best to be obedient, and I saw, I walked as far away from him as I could get. He's over there next to the window, like you two guys in the back, right back there. He's over there eating at a table. So I went as far away as I could get to the table over here at this small restaurant, right, to get away. And I didn't stare at him or wave at him and all that kind of foolishness. I was minding my own business. I ate my breakfast. 
and he was still sitting chatting with his son when he, when I got up to leave. I walked over to the counter to pay my bill. As God is my witness. That man got up from that table, he was eating. He walked over there. And he gave me the more gentle hug I ever had, had in my life. <coughs> Kissed me on both cheeks. And he had never seen me before in my life. And you tell me I ain't knew I was alive. I swear to God. <coughs> That's what I have the confidence. I walked up behind Bill Sears one time at a convention. <coughs> I think it was 1963 or four. I was standing behind him. He never looked at me. He hadn't seen me. And in my heart, he was talking to somebody and I wanted to have lunch with him. And all of a sudden, he just turned around and says, I'll meet you over there one. We'll have lunch. I can sit there all day long and tell stories like that. There was no need of faking it around the animal cause. If I was in a meeting with Bill somewhere, then I, I'm a board member in that area and know the people. I'll guarantee you, there's something wrong in your soul. When he went out of that meeting, I'd been in a room with him. He'd ask me, what's wrong with so-and-so? What's going on with that person? He never saw him before, but he could feel it. That's what you dealt with when you were with the hand of the cause of God. So you always told the truth. You didn't play games. And you always, if Bill was alive today and I had a spiritual problem, I'll guarantee you I'd call and see if I could go see him. I have a friend, Howard Mending, not of the of Cape Verde Island, who's still alive over in West Virginia. He helped teach me the faith in Dallas in 1959. He had a son, Claire. He and his wife had been nights nice behind the Cape Verde Islands off the coast of Africa. And his son had married, had a little eight-year-old, uh, eight-month-old child. And his wife, Joanne, died. And within eight months, his son was in an accident in the Oak Cliff area of Dallas, and he was killed. Well, I was living in Atlanta, and Howard was just out of it. He was just lost, that's all. He lost everything for his concern. He had another two other children, but he was he was really hurt. And he called me, and I had in the meantime and arranged to go see Bill about some problem I was having from Atlanta. I was still a board member then. And I said, Howard, you know Bill longer than I have. Why don't you ask him if he you can come with me and you can meet me at the airport in Atlanta and in Dallas. I've got a little there and we'll go together. And that's what he did. Well, I went out there and I was sitting out in the little living room here talking to Bill and the Howard's back in the kitchen talking to Marguerite. And all of a sudden while she was talking to him, she stopped talking and she said, Howard, Abba Baha was just here. And he said, if you quit grieving for him, for your son, you're hurting his soul in the next world. So help me God, that's exactly what happened. Later, there was a tablet where Abba Baha says too much grieving for your loved ones in the next world hurts their soul in the next world because they're so sensitive to it. Don't do it. Give them to God. You know, after Bill Sears died himself, I was out there within an hour or two after his death. He had a close friend, Glenn, who lived up in the northwestern part of Arizona. And he had taken Marguerite and himself to a meeting in that town right by Phoenix. I can't think of the name of it right now. Wealthy town. They'd been there that weekend and came back home. They were living down in Tucson, and this friend drove them. And when Marguerite came home, she found she had left her address book, which she had built it had all those years in Pioneer in Africa. And she was very upset about it, so he drove her all the way back up there to the motel that stayed and see if they'd left. They had not, and it was lost. That was Sunday evening. Bill 
got very ill in the morning on Tuesday morning before daylight about four o'clock trying to go to the restroom on a walker and fell. She was able to get him up, fell again when he's going back from the restroom about far from here to the first row there. And he, she couldn't get him up to get in bed. And he told her, he said, you called Dave Haddon, that was a close friend of theirs, to come over here about six and just put a blanket over me. It's a soft rug and a pillow and I'll be all right. And she did that and she called them at, at about 6.15 and they came and he came in they had a cup of coffee they went in to get filled up and he was gone. So when I get there at 10 o'clock, this guy Dan, we had driven them to up there near Phoenix, those meetings had already arrived, he was close friend of theirs. And when he had walked into the room where Bill had fallen and passed away, he heard Bill Sears' voice as clear as I'm talking to you. And he told him, he said, Dan, look up in the closet there at the top. Marguerite's address book is in the top of the closet and she's going to need it. And he got it and he gave it to her. But you know, I'm a skeptic and I admit it to any of you. I don't believe stuff easy. So I went in and asked Marguerite, I said, I understand you got your address book back. He said, oh yeah, Bill told Dan where it was and he got it for me. She just took it for granted. That's the way those two people live. You know, when she first married Bill, he wasn't a Baha'i. He was a news and a, and a very fine entertainer on television, top paid entertainer. And she knew he was interested in and, and so she gave him the book because he loved he loved drama and he read Dawnbreakers for three weeks, read it three times, cover to cover. And because of that he told her he was ready to become a Bobby. <laughs> So she wrote the secretary right now and said that time was hard as Holly and asked him, he said, just be patient with it. And he became a Baha'i. And then the Guardian announced the world embracing crusades and Baha'is all over the world. They go, you know, be nice, Baha'u'llah, and so forth. And uh, so Bill wanted to go, and so did Marguerite very much. But he was had this big job, and if he left, he would have to close down his television show and 56 people that helped produce it would lose their jobs and they didn't want to do that. And yet, and here they're toward in their soul, wanting to go serve the faith, but feeling responsible for other people's welfare. Margaret said they decided they'd say prayers for 19 days. The 16th day in the morning, the manager of the station called and said, you don't have to worry about it anymore. He said, the, the sponsors of your show have decided independently of anything else that they cannot afford to sponsor it anymore. We're gonna to have to shut it down. They went as pioneers to Africa. Uh, from my view, don't mess with the whole lot. He wants you to go get you. And you know, it's a serious thing that Jeep was talking sort of Passed this morning about saying who Baha'u'llah was. I'd like to read you the word himself saying that because it's, uh, if I didn't believe that Baha'u'llah was the return of Jesus Christ and the glory of the Father, I wouldn't be here five seconds. I don't care if you were all saints. I believe in Jesus Christ with my whole soul. And the only reason I'm a Baha'i is because I know who Baha'u'llah is. In his own words, here's what he says about it. And it's what has been to me a saving grace all my life because this is my background and my roots. From the, this is Abel Baha speaking from the words of the gospel. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you unto all truth. That's the word of Jesus Christ in the gospel. The century has dawned when the spirit of truth can reveal these verities to mankind. Proclaim that very word, establish the real foundations of Christianity, and deliver the nations and peoples from the bondage of forms and imitations. The cause of discard, prejudice, and animosity will be removed. The basis of love and amity be established. 
And friends, I was raised not in a religious background. My father was a politician, ran for state senator, was barely beaten, but came close friend of the guy that beat him in the race. My earliest memories as a little child, before World War II, were going to these little meetings where the political meetings every night at a different place. It was always held them in church places. In the church, they have big church make money from selling coats and so forth. So I know something about politics. I set up a very large Head Start program I helped set up in this country. I helped set up a lot of these programs that are still running today, Job Corps. I know something about dealing with politicians. The best psychologist in the world, but you close the doors, they're like dealing with a bunch of snakes sometimes, man. They want power and they get it. And it's been true, I've worked in and out of 34 countries in every country I've been in. People who are in that business have to cut deals to get where they got. They can't have it. That's the nature of it. And it's not going to establish world peace. It never has in the history of humanity. I'd like to read you what the purpose of the Baha'i Faith is from our writing. Now, because of what I say about it, this is what we believe. It's what we work for. It's what we give our lives for. This is the meaning of all the truth that Christ had promised would come when he came again. Baha'u'llah teaches that the world of humanity is in need of the breath of the Holy Spirit. For in spiritual quickening and enlightenment, true oneness is attained with God and man. Universal peace is an impossibility through human and material agencies. It must be through spiritual power. There is need of a universal impelling force which will establish the oneness of humanity and destroy the foundations of war and strife. None other than the divine power can do this. Therefore, it will be accomplished through the breath of the Holy Spirit. And friends, that is the whole purpose that you're a Baha'i or I'm a Baha'i. And there's no other way this world's gonna have peace. You live in a city that can be wiped off the map in 15 minutes by a handful of people with nuclear, chemical, or biological, weapons if they get their hands on it. And there are people willing to do it and dive with it and happy to do it. In order to have peace, you have to have a change in the heart of humanity. And you're not going to make it, and I'm not going to make it, and God will make it, and he sent the means for it, and you are the means of that breath spreading these teachings throughout the world. And there's no second way around it. I hate to be blunt. There are hundreds of wonderful, saintly ministers in the world. They don't have the message for it. They have a relationship with their Lord, but that's as far as it goes. Their Lord has returned. They don't know that. It doesn't mean they're blind. Many of you are familiar with the prayer of Allah, the tablet of Amun. You know what he says. Their superstitions have become veiled between them and their own hearts. Now look, I was a very sincere country kid growing up. I carried a rabbit foot in my pocket for three or four years thinking it was going to bring me good luck until I thought about what happened to the rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm serious, that's just the exact truth. I can believe something sincerely and it can be baloney. I've been over half this world and seen what the high faith can do when the Holy Spirit's moving through it. And the thing that kept me going is by with these hands of the cause. And I, I tell you, I have, I don't know how many letters from this hand, Faisy. I don't tell you how I met the guy. When I became a Baha'i in 59, you recall the guardian died February the 4th, 1957. I became a Baha'i. So I missed meeting the guardian. I'd heard of the Baha'i Faith when I was being trained in Fort Sam Houston from a guy named Stephen Soon. He first told me about it in 1953, I guess it was, back there in the 50s. And I, I just didn't pay much attention to it. And I hate to admit it, but I, I'm, gonna tell you, I'm trying to tell you the truth. That book that's what Mark wrote, he gave me, you know, with Baha'u'llah and the New Year, right? And I didn't read it because it had an ugly cover. <laughs> and I still would read a book with an ugly cover. I, I just despise ugly covers on books. But 
the book's worth print, for God's sake, put a decent cover. <laughs> Cheap, ugly looking book. I'm sorry, you're new here to buy it, but everybody's better than I am, so don't judge your friends by me. But I like to see a pretty book. And I didn't read it, so I didn't know anything about Baha'i. And eventually I became a Baha'i, and I heard about this man, Fazy, 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 Fazy. He had been appointed a hand, the last group of the hand ever appointed in 1957, just before the Guardian died. And I go to London Congress, 1963, and there's the man. See, there he is. I'm going to get to meet him. And I stayed in a little hotel just down a block from that place where they held that huge conference, Prince Albert Hall. Just one block down, and he was standing in there too. I thought, man, yeah, I got it made. I walked in there one day, and he was talking to his Persian friends. I didn't want to interrupt. And so later in the week, I walked in, and there were two women that I knew from South Carolina where I was living at the time. And they were talking to him. I thought, well, boy, this is my chance, right? I get to meet this famous man. Well, when they finished, I walked up, introduced myself, and he said, hello, how are you? And that was it. Well, man, I'll tell you, I felt just like that. He didn't give me any time. And I'm trying to be honest, it hurt. Because I had so many hopes of meeting this wonderful person. I'm just hiring you. And I said, and he'd been talking to these two dodo women that I had known. <laughs> They hadn't done anything much to serve the faith I had, I thought. And I was full of myself, so. When that happened, I just came on back home and I was at the bottom of the bucket, you know. And David Rue, who later served, he was Secretary of the NSA at that time. He later served as a member of the House of Justice, I guess, for 25 years. He came to Atlanta where I was living and encouraged us to go on pilgrimage, right? We go on pilgrimage to Haifa, those of you who are Baha'is and all of that. And visit the shrine of the Baal, the shrine of Baha'u'llah. Well, I go there, and I'm a Texan. You would think that I'm from New York City, the way I talk, wouldn't you? I didn't <laughs> yeah, well, I'm not, friend. I'm from Texas, and I drink coffee, and that's my holy water, and that's it. <laughs> and I'm sitting there on that bus, riding up from Tel Aviv up to Haifa. Caught a little old bus. I couldn't afford the route that you go down there, you know. Had to borrow money to go and get down there and look up there and see that golden dome, the shine of the Bible. I'll never forget it. It's 1964 April. And going up the mountain, you know, they play this loud, loud radio in there. Well, they did back in those days on there. But go tell it on the mountain, <laughs> over hill and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain. Jesus Christ has come. Man, if I was on one of the bus here with Jesus Christ, he'd come. They didn't know. I was ecstatic. I said, how did God put that on this bus? And then around the corner, and he just put the cream on the cake. Oh, the yellow little rose of Texas. I was, I was, da I was dancing when I got off the bus. I was so I don't know what to do. And I went down there to that little pilgrim house. And these two old ladies, I forget their name right now, one from Philadelphia. They, looked, they took care of the place and had served the hands. And so the, this hand was because uh, Paul Haney was going to take us to the Shrine of the Bible, the first thing. Haney was sort of a so very serious minded guy. And he took us to the, there were seven, only seven pilgrims, you know, that I like now. And so he took us up and introduced us to the Shrine of the Bible and told us about it. And we said prayers. But he did one thing I'll never forget. He was a tall, thin man with an old suit on. And he kneeled down to pray with his head on the shrine. And he had a big hole in his sock, and I could see it. And I thought, you know, he's my kind of man. He's not putting on pretense for anybody or something. I'll never forget that. And I came on back, and then all of a sudden I said, well, Mr. Face is coming this afternoon. He's going to take you for the first time to the shrine of Elba. And let me tell you the truth. All the way to Haifa, I've been praying, seriously, protect me from phasing. <laughs> now, I'm not joking. I didn't want any more. I didn't want you. I'd interpreted that. You know, I meet you up in England and London. I didn't want any more treatment like that, you know. Poor little Jack. Well, phasing came that afternoon. 
and change my whole life. He took us to the throne of the Bob game. <coughs> you know, the garden used to have the prayer visitation the shrines up on the wall, painted in red letter in those days on a sign. And then we went to the shrine of Ababa. And it was tough on me. I'm not thinking. I'm telling you just like it is. I was a Texan with boots, right? The only thing, I didn't have my spurs on. It's the only difference. And they told you, you got to take your boots off before you go in the shrine. That's, that's a sacrifice. <laughs> you know, you birds are so clean, y'all take your shoes off before you go in the house. Hell, I was going to wear my boots right into heaven, man. <laughs> and he said, take your boots off. And I took them off. And I got in there, and the dad took him over to the shrine of Abba Baha and walked in there with Fazy. And he went up to the front, and the little the, the, the prayer for the shrine of, of Abba Baha is there on the, on the side of the wall on the left hand side. And our little group standing started in the back. And he said he chanted this prayer, and I thought he was chanting this tablet of visitation to the shrine of the Baha.
Every day of my life, I still say what the Christians call the Lord's Prayer. It's a part of my life. But that's the only prayer Jesus left us with. Baha'u'llah has left us with prayers for everything, and so has Ephraim. And you are the only people in the world that have the prayer straight from the mouth of God through their prophet. And the Holy Spirit of God breathing you through that prayer, His Spirit, into your life. Nobody else has it. Nobody else has that. You're the most fortunate people in the world to have access to those prayers. I've worked many years, 30-something years, in the field of various aspects of public health. I had many psychiatrists working under me. They were wonderful doctors, but they couldn't make you forgive people. They couldn't make you love people. They could help you understand why you didn't come to grips with it. And friends, in all due respect, and humble as I can say, you can't change yourself just because you want to. Give it the best try you want, you can be a better person. But it takes the power of God Almighty and His Spirit to change you. There is a God. And the breath of the Holy Spirit is real. And when you meet individuals who have that spirit flowing through them like the hand, it changes your life. Because you've never felt love like that. Most of the hands that I knew and knew well, they didn't teach and talk to you. They just listened to you. They did more listening to you than you do talking to folks. They just immersed your soul in their love while they were listening. I've never known anybody like that. And they all had their qualities, you know. Many of you knew poor Tad. He was the best person with little children I've ever been around in my life. He could make a rock laugh, you know. He would joke, and Joe, I was him one day, and that little pat went up to the shrine of the Bobby, and on each corner you have a, a symbol of the greatest name, right? A little girl this tall, he said, do you see that? And she said, oh, yes, I see. He said, I know you don't see that. And she just began to throw a fit. I do see it. And he was teasing him, because you know, I mean, you're just saying that to please me. And he just played with that little girl, you know. And he was so full of life, you know. So full of life. And Mahajir, man, Mahajir, Mahajir, Mahajir. I was in the Pacific nine years almost pioneering. You know what they call him in the Pacific? <laughs> Deep in the night. Because you never knew when he was coming or when he was going, ever. He didn't prepare you. We were going to have the hand that calls you next Thursday. No, it's, there he is. And he wanted something going on. I was with him in, in, in Pontypas in Eastern Carolina. We now have a national assembly there. Eastern Carolina was no assembly there then. And we had this meeting in these outer islands from the main place. And we go up there, and he only went because I begged him to. I didn't realize he had a health problem at the time. And we go up there, you know, you men, you'd really like it because, you know, women have to sit in the back of the church. That really, that really suits your ego, you know. Women have to sit in the back, women, men in the front. And so we're sitting up there, and here's my Hodge and myself, and Harlan Lang, who's still alive out in California. And they take, make you take your shirt off and they bathe you in this sweet smelling fragrant oils and they put flowers around your head. They call them a palm bar and that kind of stuff, you know. And we're doing that and Mahadri is there. And later then he sends us over to another island. He goes on back to the main island and we go to Tepic Island, small island. I'm telling you the truth. Please believe it. With there, there's a man that had died there one year ago from the time we get there and they were having a wake, a one year later wake, which is their custom there. And the Catholic priest, who was his priest, was in charge of the wake, you know. And all these people sit on the floor in the islands there. They don't sit in chairs. And here I'm sitting there in the middle of the wake, three people away, and there's the priest doing his thing. And God is my witness. I brought three people into the faith right there during that wake. You think it had anything to do with me? It had nothing to do with me. It had to do with the fact that Mahaja was praying for us. There was a guy named Erlinus. He walked 11 miles through the jungles at night to come to hear 
I just talked because he'd heard that a new religion was coming. Walked through his rainforest barefoot. He's still a boy. That's the kind of man Mahajra was. And I know I had had a, I lived up in Guam at that time. And I had people sitting in chairs. And he was so kind to me. But the next day he said, don't let people sit on chairs. Have, have them sit on the floor. It's their background. He wanted you to follow the background of where the people, wherever they are. He wasn't there taking Western civilization into a world that's different. He wanted you to reach the people where they were. And he did that everywhere he went. And he paid great attention to it. And he even made pay attention how much you spent for breakfast when you were traveling. He didn't want you to eat too little, but he didn't want you to spend a bunch of money either. It was a very oriented person. I knew the man, he had a, a, a boat, he had a, he had a stack of books like this with him. And they were all books from various churches. And in my background, I had been a Methodist minister, ordained Methodist minister, and he wanted me to read them. I said, no, I, I, I'm, I'm done with that. He said, no, Jack, he said, if they have found a way to, to propagate their, their beliefs or advertise how going to that does not violate some of our spiritual principles, we need to learn from them and use them. And I did, I read and he had me to send them to a man who was a close friend of mine, Hedy Amadea, who was a counselor down here in Bailey's, on most of them. And I sent the books on to him, but my heart just, mind was open to learning anything he could to spread the faith, but he wanted action. Now, friends, can I get serious a moment? And I am serious about it, because, you know, I'm old. Perhaps there's someone in this room older than me, but if you are, it's not by much. I'm 84 years old. And I certainly won't be here much longer. Abba Baha said we should make an effort, and God will assist and confirm you to lead at least one soul to the faith each year. Now, if you want to tell yourself you can't do it, you're just lying to yourself. And I hate to just use the word lie, but that's just a lie. Have a lie has promised that he'll help you bring one soul to the faith. I can show it to you in writing. In the old translation of the prayer for the southern state, of the southern state it, there's a phrase that said, Far be it from me to become confirmed in this work, say, Thou hast assist me with the breath of the Holy Spirit. Make me victorious through the armies of thy supreme kingdom and encircle me with thy confirmations which shall make the moth the eagle, the drop the rivers and the seas, the scintillas, the suns and the moon. O Lord, confirm me with thine insuperable power and thy penetrating power so that my tongue may speak out thy praise and glorification amongst thy creatures and my heart become overflowed with the wine of my love and knowledge. That prayer was given to you. Had you been a Baha'i in Africa or Asia, you wouldn't have that prayer for you. Nobody got it but Americans and Canadians in that part of the world. They got those special prayers. And you're in a place where you're going to need it. Now, I want to read this quote to you. Please listen to it with your heart. Put your mind in neutral. Listen to this. May your hearts become so attracted that the instant a question is asked, you will be able to give the right answer and that the truth of the Holy Spirit may speak through your tongues. Now that's the spirit of Abba Baha speaking in this book, Promulgation of Universal Peace, page 645. <laughs> Friends, I see the truth is a lie. You can't fake this stuff. You can't make you love somebody you don't love. Only God can change your heart. Every hand I knew totally relied on that. I was a, Leroy, I was a hand with his sister. They were, had been pioneered in Jamaica that moved up to Florida. And I had the bounty of being with him one evening. And I had a close friend, Kenneth Rogers, African American, probably was a lawyer. And he asked him, you know, how can you overcome alcohol, drinking alcohol, because he liked to drink alcohol. He said, well, you know, look around you. This is what I was his answer was, an example of him as a teacher, as a hand teaching. 
He said, we're living here almost on the edge of the great swamps, you know, over there in, in Florida, this huge area of Everglades. He said, the people build their houses on stilts, you know, way above the water. And they put all these screens around to protect from mosquitoes and all these bugs and sprays. He says, that's the way the world deals with these problems like alcoholism and all this other stuff. He said, the Baha'i way is very different. We drain the swamp. That's a totally different world to drain the swamp. And you start in your own soul draining the swamp. You know. And when you're in a group of people who are giving their lives, really giving their lives to bring peace to this planet and have a message for that purpose and trying to do the best they can, it changes everything about you slowly, slowly, slowly. When you become so-called born again, the garden says it's like planting a seed. And that seed grows slowly, but gradually, gradually becomes your whole life. Everything about it becomes your life. I talked with Agnes Alexander shortly before her death and her cause. And she didn't remember so much as going on last week, but I guarantee you she remembered every little thing happened to her when she was young. <laughs> You know, she was one of the first young women to ever go to Haifa and meet Abba Baha and all these things. And that woman, as God is my witness, is like looking at a huge searchlight inside of her just beaming out of her. It just, it just beamed out of her. The most wonderful, accepting elderly lady I was ever around in my entire life. I've never around anybody like that. So wonderful, these people, at the hand of the cause of God. Mr. Cottenham, I worked to many, many years as a board member under him. He had these little cards he would write on. Let me see if I'm going over time here. I see people leaving here. And I got 15 minutes. Uh, you, the G, stand up, wave, and send, stop, you know. Yeah, I'm safe a little while longer. Mr. Codem didn't have time to write letters. He had a little business card. He would just write, Jack, you need to do this or do that or do this and that. And he paid me, friends, to me. I think the greatest compliment I ever had in my life from a hand of the cops came from him. I'll never forget it, how much it meant to me. He said, Jack, you have a pure heart. I don't need to tell you what to do. Now, you can't get a better compliment than that. Mr. Cotton could no more sit here and talk as long as I've talked without crying that he could be shot because he started talking about the garden and he loved the ground the garden walked on. He loved Shogi Affinity. He loved Shogi Affinity. That was one constant in every hand that I knew personally, that love for Shogi Affinity. It was so real you could touch it. Now, if you were alive in those days, I'm real serious about what I'm saying to you today. I'm not just making some bye talk. If Shogi Affinity was still alive and you were leaving here today, and going to be in Haifa in the morning and be there for nine days. One night you would stay in, in Baji, Baha'u'llah's mansion, and the garden would not be with you. But for eight nights you would be there at that table with him. What question would you ask? Man, that's a serious thing to contemplate because you're going to get a straight answer. It'll be the correct one. I never knew, and I'm sure there are people that didn't react the way I've gone. But friend, I swear before God, I never knew anybody in my life that met with Shogi Fendi, the guardian of faith, that appointed these hands, that their meeting with him changed their life. They were good people, knowledgeable people before they went there, but it changed their whole life. And these hands were appointed by Shogi Fendi. 
Now you look at a person we Baha'is believe was chosen by God to lead this faith, to set up the world order of Allah, to bring peace to this planet. He chose 42 people, eight of them I guess had passed on, but he chose the rest of them. I knew I saw 27 of them, but I worked with 17 of them. Briefly, in some cases, some cases extended length of time. How do you know to pick who, who, how to pick those people? He didn't pick a bunch of losers. <clears throat> if you think it's easy to walk in the footsteps of a hand, you're a fool. I hate to be blunt, but I don't know how to get through to you. Anymore. Man, those people walk in the paths of Baha'u'llah every day of their life, day and night, day and night, day and night. And they didn't deviate from it. They didn't deviate at all. And when, you, when you're around that kind of an individual or working for them, here I am, a young man, and appointed an auxiliary board member in the early 60s by Mr. Kadem and Mr. Sears and Robarts and Gia Carey. And only two of them are running around the South. That is a heavy responsibility, man. If you've got any sense at all, you know you can't handle it. And for what for them, there's no way in the world we could have done our job. Their prayers are what saved us. Their guidance when necessary was what saved us. Any time I needed help and was just desperate, I'd call Mr. Cardell and he'd come. He never said no. He never said no. I'm not coming. I'll never forget one time I, I met him on a train there in Atlanta. The old train was a cheap train, dirty, newspapers on the floor. He was tired and exhausted, but he came. Now, I hate to, hate to sound so serious all the time about this, but this is serious business. And Bill Sears can stand, and many of you have access to the internet, you can pull up the talks of Bill Sears, and even Fazy and some of the other hands that they taped at the time, or made movies of. But that's not the same thing as working with. They knew what was necessary for these little fledgling communities to keep going in the midst of all this stress they were under. There was no black and white. The only black and white people together meeting at that time that I was in was in behind me. Everybody else was scared to death. But people were killing each other. And there was so much love between all of us that you were giving your life to somebody. It wasn't some conscious thing, it was real. And we could not have done it without the hand of the cause. From 1953 to 19, uh, 1957 to 1963, all of the control of the guidance of the whole Baha'i world at that time, all the NSAs in existence then was under the control of the hand of the cause of God. Later, shortly after the appointment of the House of Justice, they began setting up what we know today as the International Teaching Center. And they appointed three counselors, Aziz Yazi, many of you knew Aziz, I knew him very well. Knew him in Africa, when he was in Kenya. Stayed in his home there. Florence Mayberry from this country. And Hoover Dunbar was still alive. And they worked with the hands to set up the International Teaching Center. Or you can go there now and meet with them. You know, hundreds of people go on pilgrimage now. Didn't used to be that way when we had those hands. But I would like to say this as clear as I can. If it had not been for the hands of the call, you wouldn't be here today, friend. My faith would have split into 15 or 16 different sects within two years. Because there's a many strong minded Baha'is who want to tell you what this means or that means. Even though we have an authorized interpreter in Abba Baha, they want to tell you what Abba Baha meant by what he wrote, you know. It takes more than that to be a Baha. And I think, you know, the sad thing to me with my time with the hands is 
Do you know the times when you fail and it still bothers? It breaks my heart. They wanted you to do something, you just didn't get it done. It stays with you because they're so good to you. So real to you. I wish there was still one alive today. You know, the thing that bothered me the most of all the questions is my life. This won't interest maybe over two or three people in here, but if you're a deep in Baha'i, it will interest you. You know, I have a Baha'i had four daughters, they all turned against him. Have a Baha'i had some half brothers, they turned against him. But at least in the life of Abu Baha, his daughters were faithful. In the life of Baha'u'llah, his sons were faithful. In the life of the guardian, none of them were faithful. You take that home and put it in your pipe and puff on it, friend. I heard Hanum say in the 40s, there was nobody faithful in all of Haifa except she and a gardener. And the gardener died. Remember when he appointed her a hand of the cause, he called her, her his shield and his buckler. And she said that the guardian never laughed for several years until Ashby began to appoint the hands. Then he got joy back in his life again because it was faithful. It meant everything to the faith, these hands, what they did for you. They held it together. There's a guy named Marangella tried to break up and tear up the faith and had to disband the entire NSA of the French NSA when he did that. Only three of them were faithful. I was walking out of the door of the London Congress when I saw Adam the Cost Shulai talking to an old lady who could no longer live with her own son because he'd become a covenant breaker. Consoled because she had been in France when all that mess happened. We always have egotistical people. You're going to have it as long as you got people. Now, how do you deal with it and maintain the Spirit of God and bring peace to this planet? Friends, seriously, if you take seriously the message of Baha'u'llah, what's the purpose of it? It's to bring the kingdom of the living God to this planet. It's not going to be instant. It's going to take several hundreds of years, obviously. It takes growth and development. But you should be able to pass on to your children a better developed faith than we have in the world than it was when you came into it. And in the end, what are you going to say to your Lord when you meet him face to face? I hate to be blunt, but you're going to. You know, Christ revealed certain spiritual eternal laws he said, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. If any of you sitting in this room have any hard feelings against anybody and you die, you're up the creek, friend, because you didn't forgive the person just because they sinned against you. And that's the only way God Almighty will forgive you is that as you forgive. If you fake some other way just because I believe Jesus did everything for me or something. He taught you the way, but you got to follow. And using his own words, he said to these people, you did it under the least of these, and as much as you did it under the least of these, you did it unto me also. That's the story of Baha'u'llah. If you read his story and take seriously your Lord, Five and a half months in the Sea of Child dungeon. I've seen the chain. Some of you have seen it in the archives building. I have a 110 pound chain. Physically, he was barely five feet tall as a human. Little man with that chain hanging around his neck. Five and a half months yoked to prisoners and killers and mean people. Human filth all over the floor in pitch darkness. How in the name of God Almighty could you have lasted that long? That's the facts of life. And here's a person who had all access to all the power of God 
and he took it on himself for your sake. And that's not a bunch of baloney that happened. You can see his original writing, you can see the change, you can see the results of it. There's no reason in the world why he would do that if he didn't love you. It doesn't make sense. And there's no life after death, there's no point in him doing it. None. It's stupidity. It's the same when Christ, the first time he came, he had access to all the angels and power of the world, tempted by the devil, supposedly, however you want to interpret it. All I struggled with all this mess, lived with it for 40 years, and so did Abba in prison, and with egotistical people fighting against him constantly. That you could be here. Man, I wouldn't take a million dollars in cold cash for a Baha'i prayer book today for no living human being. I wouldn't take a billion for it. The flowing of the Holy Spirit of God through those prayers can change the heart of a rock if they'll open their heart to it. You can't change yourself. If you think so, you're the biggest fool that God ever saw on the planet. You can't do it. You can try all you want to. And the thing that these hands did for me is they were so different. They were not at all alike as individuals. But the Holy Spirit of God flowed through them and their talents to bring unity and harmony to people, to encourage you to be your best. They didn't try and change you and make you like this person or that person. They wanted you to be you with the Spirit of God flowing through you and being happy. You know what Faye told me to my face? He said, Jack, nobody wants to be around a miserable boy. A boy, I raised my hand, and I have been around some of them, and I don't want to be around. When you get close to God, you're not miserable, even if you're dying. You're getting closer and closer to the Spirit of the living God. And when a group of Baha'is get together and really pray, it changes everything in the whole community. The one thing that the hands I saw every time I went to walk in a room, they found out, they could just pick out the soul that needed the pat on the back quicker than anybody, and that's the first person they'd go to. And just shower with them. I've got a friend right now named Roger Welsh. He lives in a little island in Hawaii. Been home front pioneering there for 30 years all by himself. Reason was able to get married. And he said, Bill Sears in a big meeting he was in just came and gave him this big hug. He still wanted why in the world he gave him that hug. Oh, I know why he needed it for him. Nobody loved Roger. He was way overweight, running a popsicle truck in Honolulu when he met Bill. But Bill Sears how knew he was sincere in his heart and he needed to be loved and appreciated. And if you wanted to be loved and appreciated, you got around the hand of the cause you were. And you were appreciated and loved for being who you were. God created you to know him and to worship him, and they knew that. Now, I know I haven't talked all these stories about individuals I've known because it just goes on and on. And I know you have a lot, lot to do with your, your own time. I'd just like to close with one thought from the hands that I've known. Every hand I knew encouraged you to make a pilgrimage if you haven't made one. Now, I don't know if some of you have not made a pilgrimage, but have thought about it. I'd encourage you to make it. I don't care whether you're Baha'i or not, thank you. And I'll guarantee you, friend, when you lay your head on that shrine of Baha'u'llah's and come out of there, you will never be the same person you went when you went before you went in there. The greatest peace on the planet Earth is in that shrine right now. You can feel it go through your whole soul. If you haven't been on a pilgrimage, I beg you to consider writing and get in line to go. 
you haven't experienced it, it'll open your heart and it stays with you, it doesn't go away. I've been several times, obviously. But that's the home of the soul. And I knew many hands there. And I'll never forget any hand I ever met. Because they were the hands of the Almighty God. And God uses those hands to caress you and to hold you up and to pat you on the back. If it hadn't been for those hands, you would be. If you want to know the details of the hand, if you have a computer, all you have to do is write into the internet section, hands of the cause of God, or if you want to put in the high hand of the cause of God, the whole history of this thing. And it's accurate history. You know, it's buy a book, just go home and put it in there. And you have it, and you can study it, and find out what you want to, and talk to the people that know it. So I hope I said something today that's meaningful to you, because our life is short, and this is a rough world we're living in, and it's getting rougher every day. You can't turn on any news report here at night that somebody's been murdered right here in Houston. Some awful thing. That's not the way God wants this world. He has sent his own son back into this world as the father in his own glory and made it available to every living human. But he does it through you. He does it through you. And I hope God blesses you today and brings your happiness and enables you to feel something of his closest to you. So let's keep one thought in mind as we leave. Baha'u'llah says this, He's closer to you than your own life being. Than your own children being. That's how close he is to you. Are you aware of it? A lot.